Step forward. I'm not doing it. <laughs> you like me, but not that much, right? I don't even know if I like you anymore. Oh, man. All right. If you get it clicked on, and switch on the side. Okay. All right. Well, again, let me introduce Ken Paul from Alakai Technologies. Uh, I've known Ken for a while. He's uh, the company he works with is uh, developing some technology, a uh, couple different phenomenologies um, for DHS and DOD. Uh, we've had them develop systems before and also do a number of basic research activities. And um, I think this is the first. Uh, Presentation I've seen on in inducing a safety feature, which uh, let's see where this goes. So, as Mike said, uh, Alakai Defense Systems. Good. Alakai Defense Systems. Uh, we're a small company. Uh, we're primarily focused on developing standoff detector technologies uh, for Homeland Security and for the Army. Uh, this. Uh, what I'm going to be showing you now is, is kind of a side uh, benefit of the work that we uh, started doing with Mike. Let me jump right into it. Here's your scenario. You get a 911 call, comes in. Uh, there's a report of some suspicious package in a trash can on a street corner somewhere, anywhere USA. Okay, this uh, Google Maps is great. This is street view. This is the aerial view of, of uh, that trash can. <clears throat> what, EOD, what EOD teams would like to be able to do in this scenario is come in and at a safe standoff range, let's say 40 meters, use a standoff uh, sensor technology like Ramon spectroscopy or PD lift or whatever. They want to be able to interrogate the contents of that trash can and look for evidence of trace explosives or other threat materials, uh, uh, hazardous chemicals, whatever. That's what they'd like to do. The question is, what are they allowed to do? How do the regulations for ocular safety impact this mission? Well, here's that same system. It's sitting about 40 meters away from the target. Uh, for the calculation that I'm going to show you, I've assumed a deep UV Raman system with some relatively typical power levels. Uh, I'm assuming that, you're going, that they're going to interrogate the trash can for 60 seconds. That's an operationally reasonable period of time. And of course, they're going to set up some sort of uh, safety perimeter around the target uh, just to exclude people for blast effects. I'm not an expert in that. I don't know exactly how big that, that zone is going to be, but you can imagine something like that. Well, that's the blast safety exclusion zone, but what's the nominal ocular hazard zone? What's the region from which they must exclude bystanders in order to ensure compliance with the FDA, with the ANSI, with the IEC, with the Army standards for ocular safety? And the answer is shocking. You may recognize the scene. There's the Capitol building. There's the Air and Space Museum. The little yellow square there in the middle was that perimeter that, that I, I showed you set up to just keep people away from the, uh, from the blast zone. The eye hazard zone is actually 170 acres. It's a 466 meter nominal ocular hazard distance. And that's calculated uh, via the ANSI Z136.1 standards. And I used uh, the Air Force's LHAS 5.0 software to do the calculation. Now, you may think that's a ridiculous calculation, but that's the output of the safety software. And that is what you face when you want to deploy some sort of standoff optical sensor technology. We know these technologies work. We know Ramon works, uh, PD-LIF, LIBS. There's lots of technologies out there. 
Uh, there's been plenty of systems in field test. Here's, uh, for instance, a, a photo of one of our systems out in field testing at Fort Leonard Wood two years ago. That's a standoff Ramon system. Here's another system that we had in testing three years ago at the night vision labs. So we know, we know the technology can work. As a society, we've probably sunk well north of $100 million in these technologies. We've certainly sunk more than 1,000 person years of time in academia, in the government, companies like mine, developing these systems. But for all of that, right now there's very few such systems actually in the hands of operators, actually in the hands of the people that need to use them. And the number one reason for that, frankly, is eye safety, in my opinion. Eye safety is the number one barrier for homeland security, for Mike to be able to deploy systems on, the, on Main Street USA, public safety, that, that would be for fire departments, uh, emergency responders, and so forth, and even for the Army, for military operations, to send systems in theater to be used by troops. The systems have to pass safety reviews. So clearing this hurdle, this eye safety bar, is a key step in reaping the benefits of all the work that we've all been doing in standoff optical sensing. Well, can we do it using traditional standard approaches? How about motion detection interlocks? I've, I've, I've seen this proposed. We're basically going to have a, like a video camera looking out where the laser's pointed, and it's going to spot moving figures. And if there appears to be somebody moving into the path of the laser beam, we'll turn off the laser. OK. Here's another one, facial recognition. I'm actually going to use that same video camera. I'm going to look for faces in the crowd. And if I see a face anywhere near the laser beam, I'm going to shut the laser off. OK. The old standby LIDAR. I'm, I'm just going to do laser range finding, perhaps with my Ramon beam, and make sure that there is a target out there that's about the right distance, that somebody hasn't walked into the laser beam 10 feet in front of the system. The problem is none of those systems, none of those approaches handle the reality of the hazard distance you get when you go to power levels and interrogation times that are relevant for detection of real threat materials. Okay? In those situations, you get hazard zones like this. I guarantee you, somewhere between the Capitol Building and the Air and Space Museum, somebody is walking. Somebody's face is showing. So the regulators say, OK, you can't do this. You have to exclude people from this zone. What we're looking for, what we took as our motivation is, OK, given that, what can we do to come up with a new innovative approach to get to an iSafe system, to get to the point where the acquisition personnel that, that want to buy these systems, the test personnel that, that run the test ranges, can see that and can agree that the system's going to be iSafe. We've got to have as our goal realistic detection performance. That's low limits of detection, preferably trace fingerprints. That's reasonable detection times. Perhaps that's a few seconds, perhaps that's a few minutes. I'll let the operators decide what they want that to be. But it's not a femtojoule for a fortnight. It's going to have to be a reasonable power level for a reasonable period of time. The other thing I want to point out is the, the operational reality of detecting these threats. Vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices and personnel-borne improvised explosive devices have people associated with them. For Homeland Security or for the Army to use a system to try to detect a vehicle-borne IED, they're going to have to laze vehicles. And operationally, there's when, when you work through, the, when you work through the, the concept of operations of lazing vehicles at a checkpoint, you're going to do it while there are people in the car. You're going to be lazing occupied cars. You're going to, potentially, you'd like to be able to laze people to look for personnel-borne IEDs. 
And again, the motion detection, the facial recognition, the LiDAR systems aren't going to help you in that scenario. The laser safety implications for these systems depend on what laser wavelength you're using. Just quickly, you may have a deep UV system, you may have a visible system, an IR system. I'm going to show you some techniques that work across that range. The hazard effects are different uh, depending on wavelength. For deep UV, which is where I mostly work, uh, the hazard is to the eye surface, to the cornea. And it comes in the form of a temporary injury, uh, uh, like a, like a uh, sunburn, the formation of a, a non-permanent lesion on the surface of the eye. And that does heal over time. And of course, also in the deep UV, uh, only the bare eye is at risk. Uh, any form of covering uh, eyeglasses, contact lenses, uh, car window, a cockpit canopy for a helicopter, those will all block that deep UV laser, uh, and so the laser's not actually hazardous in those situations. Visible sources are quite different. Uh, with a visible source, uh, the light is focused through the lens onto the back of the retina, onto the foveal region. You get uh, around 60,000 X concentration in power. Uh, so you can generate a great deal of power on the back of the retina that causes a permanent blinding injury. We have evolved uh, uh, mechanisms to heal corneal damage, uh, but there, we don't have any mechanism that in, our, in, our, uh, in our body that heals the retinal damage that you'll get from a visible or near IR laser. Uh, just quickly, regulatory limits. Uh, I want to point out that the regulatory limits are derived from animal data. They actually shoot monkeys in the eye with lasers. And those regulatory limits are then set at about 10 times lower than the level at which any damage is detectable in 50% of the subjects. And that's detectable change, not loss of eye function. So they'll actually go in with a microscope, look into the monkey's eye, and look for any evidence of change. And if they see a change, that's flagged as damage, and that goes into the determination of the safety factor. So as a result, you get regulatory limits uh, in the form of maximum permissible exposure. That's the power level at the eye. Uh, this is for a, a deep UV laser at 500 hertz. A single pulse from that laser, the maximum exposure that you can put on somebody's eye is three millijoules per square centimeter. Of course, if you're going to fire multiple pulses, the maximum power per pulse drops. In this case, it drops linearly. In other situations, it's nonlinear. Uh, and if you run, for instance, a 30-second laser interrogation with a deep UV laser, the MPE has fallen down to 0.2 microjoules per square centimeter per pulse. And that's, that's getting low enough that you really have to wonder whether, it's gonna, whether you're going to be able to uh, get a reasonable detection signal. Some common laser systems are out there. Uh, this is the Army's uh, ANGVS-5 rangefinder. It's technically hazardous out to a range of over one kilometer. So most laser systems that you're going to run into, like this laser pointer, is a blinding death ray. This, most laser pointers that you run into in a classroom are not eye safe. They have a nominal ocular hazard distance, a range at which they are hazardous, of, of order 20 or 30 meters. So in fact, most of these lasers don't actually meet the standards required to be used as long-range standoff sensors on the battlefield. You can't use this, okay? It's not going to get approved. Uh, this is our checkpoint explosive detection system, uh, which has a nominal ocular hazard distance of about 100 meters. Uh, even these, uh, these uh, green laser dazzlers that, that the Army is using, these have really long hazard ranges. Another interesting point I'll make is that um, 
I found out uh, just last month in conversations with the Army's uh, regulatory groups that as of February, the Army has approved a green laser dazzler for use in theater. It's the first iSafe dazzler system that the, that the Army has approved. Now, first is kind of interesting because there's been dazzlers in theater since, I think, 2005. And iSafe is interesting because the system actually has a nominal ocular hazard distance of 20 meters. So if you really need a system, yes, through the course of seven years of fighting the bureaucracy, you might be able to get a system through the approval process and approve for use. But we really don't want to have that kind of delay. Another thing I learned in interacting with the Army's public uh, eye safety experts is <coughs> that while the nominal ocular hazard distance is treated as a kind of a go no go criterion by the groups that want to uh, by the groups that decide whether to buy systems for use by Homeland Security TSA and so forth or the Army it's not really uh, a factor that the laser safety experts themselves focus on. What they care about is laser class. I think we're, most of us are familiar with the laser classes. Class one is really safe. Class two is considered safe. Eye protection is normally afforded by the aversion response for class two lasers. Most laser pointers are down here in class three, although there are some that are as hazardous as class four. And most of the sensor systems that are practical for use in long-range standoff sensing are going to be are going to have power levels down here in this class three, class four range. And our goal is to basically move from here with our sensor systems back up here into class two. That'll clear that regulatory barrier, and we can actually get systems in the field. Just as a side note, I mentioned laser dazzlers. Uh, these, are, these are visible lasers, the entire purpose of which is to be intentionally directed into the eyes of civilians, okay? And they're typically class three lasers, so these are potentially quite hazardous. On the other hand, it turns out that uh, as of last month, uh, when I was, again, when I was talking with uh, the Army's laser safety people, the military is not aware of any injuries to civilians from these systems that are being used in theater. Although uh, they are in, indeed hazardous in some situations, uh, there have been a couple of incidents in which soldiers unfortunately blinded themselves by using one of these systems. In one case, a soldier was sitting inside a Humvee, wanted to turn the laser on to an oncoming car while he was sitting inside his Humvee, of course, he got a reflection off of the window glass right back into his eye and blinded himself. Exposure durations. If you look at uh, the, this is, this is a calculation based on the maximum permissible exposure for different wavelengths of laser, for, for a repetitively pulsed laser. And if you look at this, you'll notice that Visible lasers are substantially more hazardous than UV or IR lasers. Over here I'm showing you though, in the regulatory standards, when you do your safety calculations, how much time do you have to allow for? It turns out that if you're using a visible laser, you only have to do the safety calculation assuming a quarter of a second of ocular exposure. Even if you're going to use the laser for five minutes, you only assume a quarter of a second of exposure to the human eye. For a UV laser, you have to assume up to about eight hours. That means if you're going to use the laser for 10 seconds, use the number 10 seconds. If you're going to use it for a minute, use a minute. If you're going to use it for 24 hours, well, okay, you only have to assume that you're lasing somebody for eight hours in the eye. So there's this kind of Paradox, the visible lasers are far more hazardous than non-visible lasers, but they have a less restrictive intra-beam exposure duration requirement by an even bigger factor for UV, factor of 100,000. Why is this? It's something called the aversion response. 
defined in the ANSI standard, and, and it's also used in the FDA standard and the IEC standard, so across all the laser safety standards. You can't look into a bright light for very long. It just turns out. You've got a built-in reflex that prevents you from staring into the sun and burning your eyeball out. And that reflex kicks in and it prevents you from uh, achieving more than about of a quarter second of exposure to a hazardous level of visible light. Doesn't do you any good for UV, doesn't do you any good for IR. But it does prevent you from staring into a bright visible light. So fine, let's leverage that. Let's manipulate that physiological response. I'm going to use a bright visible light source to stimulate an aversion response that wouldn't otherwise normally occur in conjunction with a UV or an IR laser, and I'm going to therefore reduce your ocular exposure. That's the idea. In practice, it works about like this. No humans were injured in, in, in this test. Uh, that is uh, just an off-the-shelf uh, flashlight shined onto the, the uh, subject's face from about 20 feet away. The optical power levels were safe. Uh, but you need to trust me on this. You can't stare into that light for more than about a quarter of a second. I didn't try to time it. I didn't try to quantify the quarter of a second. But you can't stare into that light. So let me show you an example of uh, what I call stimulated aversion, utilizing that physiological response. And in this example, I'm going to go back to a 248 nanometer Raman system. Here's the, uh, here's the system parameters. And I'm going to calculate, I'm going to calculate the MPE as a function of the laser interrogation time. You actually have to do five different calculations and take the most restrictive. In this case, the most restrictive is the uh, calculation number three in the standard, the average photochemical uh, damage threshold. As a function of exposure time, it falls linearly. So if I'm going to use this laser for a tenth of a second, I'm allowed to expose people's eyes up to about, uh, this is 60 microjoules per square centimeter. On the other hand, if I'm going to use the laser for 10 seconds, it's 0.6 microjoules per square centimeter is the regulatory limit. Now let's add a stimulated aversion source. It's just a cartoon of the system. The purple is the UV Raman laser. I'm projecting coaxial with it, a visible light source. Uh, in this case, I'm going to assume a 532 nanometer green laser and my coaxial stimulation source has slightly larger divergence than the UV laser. That makes sure that you can't possibly impinge upon the UV beam without first having impinged on the visible beam. There's no place where you can see the UV beam where you don't see the visible light source first. That's shown over here in the beam profiles. What that aversion beam does for you is basically puts a kink in the curve at a quarter of a second. You can't stare into the visible light for more than a quarter of a second, so you can't stare into the UV beam for more than a quarter of a second. The result is you don't have to worry about these uh, extremely low required power levels if you're going to use the system for a minute or five minutes. Now, if your scan time, if your laser interrogation time is a quarter of a second, the MPE without aversion is 24 microjoules per square centimeter. With aversion, it's the same because that's this point right here. That's the quarter of a second that I have to assume before the visible aversion reflex kicks in. But if I scan for longer, let's say for five minutes, I took that to be an operationally relevant uh, interrogation time, kind of you know, at, at the far end of operationally relevant. At, at five minutes, you actually get a factor of 1,200 improvement. That's 1,200 times less potential damage to the eye with the aversion system than you would get without the aversion system. And that's a real reduction in the, uh, in the ocular damage that somebody out there could receive from your system. 
I get asked this occasionally. Okay, so I'm adding another light source. Doesn't that add to the hazard? It doesn't. In this case, it doesn't because the two different lasers interact with two different tissues. The UV laser is interacting in the cornea. The visible laser is interacting on the fovea. They're different tissues. The doses don't uh, add up. So you can treat them independently. Here's the same system now with a near-infrared laser. I'm using a near-infrared Raman or whatever, uh, an IR sensor laser. The safety standards say here is the maximum permissible exposure to the human eye that you can have as a function of uh, beam interrogation time. It doesn't fall linearly. Uh, it falls as time to the minus 0.25, and then it flattens out at 10 seconds. That's correct. That's reasonable. It, it turns out that's based on real animal research, and it's associated with the uh, microsaccade phenomenon, which I'll show you later. Again, I'm going to use a visible aversion source. You don't avert from the near IR hazard laser but you will avert from a low intensity visible laser. That lets you stop the clock at a quarter of a second. The hazard mitigation isn't quite as dramatic as you get in the UV case, but it's nothing to sneeze at. You get a factor of 2.5. As a function of sensor laser wavelength, in the UV you can get uh, a hazard mitigation that depends linearly with time and for instance you can get a 1200x improvement for five minute scan. In the near IR and in the far IR uh, you can get up to a 2.5x improvement in laser safety. In the visible it's a special case uh, because the if you're using a visible hazard laser it generates its own uh, gaze aversion response so it's relatively complicated exactly how you would use another visible light source to cause an aversion. All right, what other physiolog physiological responses are available? When I showed this to Mike, uh, he said, this gaze aversion is interesting. Look deeper. Look into some other responses. Well, the first one we looked into was the pupillary light reflex. Hey, guess what? Your pupils contract in the presence of bright light. The pupillary contraction reflex uh, is driven by the logarithm of the light intensity falling on your eye. It mitigates retinal damage because it basically stops down the power landing on the back of your, of your retina. It doesn't impact corneal damage, damage to the surface of the eye. So the pupillary light reflex can't impact the ocular damage from an ultraviolet or from a far infrared hazard laser but it can from a near-infrared hazard laser or a visible laser. It turns out that the pupillary light reflex is, an, is the subject of active research. And, and there are a couple of models uh, out there uh, in the literature for how the pupils react. Uh, we took a couple of those, and uh, one, one of which was a physiological model, one of which was just an empirical model, and we coupled them to uh, simulations of a laser interrogation system to try to figure out how could we manipulate the pupillary light reflex to get us additional uh, hazard mitigation above and beyond what you would just normally get. So this is, this is the standard case. Uh, this isn't a manipulated pupillary light reflex. This is just how your pupil responds to a visible hazard source, uh, just as a base calculation. Uh, starting at time zero, I turn on the visible light source. Uh, your eye begins to integrate dose on the back of the retina at, a, at this rate. After about a quarter of a second, the blue line shows you pupil diameter after about a quarter of a second, the pupil be reacts and begins to contract rapidly. That causes this red line, which is the integrated dose, to roll over. 
the pupil's contracting, so the dose rate to the pupil drops. Uh, after about a half a second, your pupil equilibrates down at about two millimeters diameter, and the dose rate falling on the back of the pupil then uh, falls to this uh, relatively constant slope. For all the calculations I do, I start assuming a seven millimeter pupil. That's the regulatory requirement. Thou shalt assume a dark adapted eye. That's the safest case. That's the most conservative calculation. So now let's use the, let's manipulate the pupillary light reflex in order to stimulate a uh, hazard mitigation. There's two different cases we have to consider, a visible, a visible or a uh, near infrared hazard laser. And again, I want to point out the regulatory limits are based on animal experiments, so they already include the pupil contraction that you would get from the visible laser. So I'm going to do the near infrared laser calculation first because there is no natural PLR response. Same cartoon, now I've got a near infrared laser with my visible uh, uh, safety inducing laser. And in this case, because I can pre-contract the, the pupil using the visible light source, the non-hazardous visible light source, I can reduce the dose from the near infrared light source by about a factor of 12. I don't have a good graph of it, it, it because it's basically an equilibrium calculation. If the hazardous light source is visible, can I still use a visible aversion source? Yeah, it turns out you can. If you turn on a bright light source that's not hazardous, about a half a second before you turn on your hazardous visible laser, you can pre-contract the pupils. That's shown here. Okay, so here's my pupil starting to contract from my aversion source. Right about here, I'm going to kick on my Raman laser. But now you can see the dose that I get onto the back of the retina is substantially less than the dose that I would have gotten if I didn't use the aversion response. The total mitigated hazard is a function of the interrogation time that you're going to use, but that's kind of summarized here. For relatively short interrogation times, you, you get a significant hazard mitigation, about a factor of five for one second. As you go out longer and longer, uh, it becomes a less and less useful factor. Uh, this just shows you, you can, you can play games with this system, you can, you can uh, manipulate the uh, aversion light source and the sensor light source and do things like contract the pupils, shoot the hazard laser. Uh, this now has the, uh, the aversion source turns off here, the pupils re-expand, I turn it back on again. So we've, we've modeled a lot of, a lot of uh, situations like this. And in general, like for, for this example, we get a mitigation of about a factor of eight. So with pupillary light reflex, what we found is that we can improve hazards by about a factor of 10 for visible and near IR. You can put the two together, combine the results. I mentioned microsaccades earlier. Uh, when I first saw this, I thought this was going to be the cat's meow. This was, this was going to be the coolest uh, method for hazard mitigation. It turns out when you try to look at a distant object, your eyes don't remain stationary and focus on the object. There's some uh, reflexive uh, behavior that causes your eyes to jitter around. As a result, a visible laser that's focused on the back of the retina the focus spot actually jumps all over the place and that spreads the, the damage out. Unfortunately, it turns out because the regulatory standards are based on animal research, this is already taken into account and it's why the slope falls off for visible hazards as uh, not linearly but as uh, time to the minus 0.25 power. So I'm going to hit that uh, example I showed you at the beginning of the talk again. Here's your suspicious package in a trash can. EOD is going to come in and try to laze that trash can and detect, look for traces of explosives. That was the nominal ocular hazard zone that we had. 
But now with stimulated aversion, you get an ocular hazard zone that's only about 21 meters across. So this is certainly small enough that the operators can control that perimeter and ensure safe operations. Uh, we're in the process right now of working with uh, Army regulators and members of the ANSI Standards Committee on how to implement this uh, in the regulatory framework. We're also in the process of integrating a system that utilizes the gaze aversion capability into our existing checkpoint explosive detection system that's a uh, long-range military explosive system. And I want to thank uh, Mike for support. Uh, this work was also supported by the Leonard Wood Institute. Thanks. It turns out that uh, it doesn't change the regulatory requirements at all. The regulatory requirements say you must assume that the subject that you're accidentally lasing has dark adapted pupils. That's a seven millimeter diameter. So, so to the regulators, they don't care whether it's day or night. You've been doing the math here. You've been showing the math throughout. When you do the math and plot the radius, how small does that become? Uh, the you can drive the pupil diameter down to about two millimeters. Do you mean the radius of the pupil or the radius of that nominal ocular hazard zone? I should ask you that. Which radius do you mean? In daylight, what is the radius of the pupil and then overlay that, about that, onto your daylight scene? You're basically showing a nighttime scene, worst case, with dark adapted eyes. Assume daylight. How does that normal? Okay, so th there's a misunderstanding then because the nominal ocular hazard zone and nominal ocular hazard distance are regulatory calculations. I can't assume daylight and assume a five millimeter pupil. They'll throw my calculations out and say, you, you didn't follow the formula. The formula says, assume a seven millimeter pupil. It may be that it's in the middle of the day, but the person that you're lazing just stepped out of the interior of, of a dark vehicle and therefore has enlarged pupils. The regulatory set that framework. I must do the calculation this way. I'm just trying to figure out then, fine, staying within that framework, can I use the, the physiological reflexes to still stay within that regulatory framework but significantly reduce the hazard? Unfortunately, a great discussion, but I think we need to move on to our next talk, but uh, perhaps after this session we can...